This is the Create Your Own Life Show, episode 715 with Mitzi Perdue. He said, I could have stood up there in front of them and said, do a good job and there's a raise in it for you. Do a good job and there's going to be a bonus for you. He said, that's bribery. And there are a number of flaws with bribery. Among them, you have to keep upping the ante. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't stay bribed. But even worse, people work for the bribe rather than for something bigger. Because father's view was that a leader's job is to give people a better vision of themselves. And what he was doing was having them see themselves as part of a winning team that was going to transform the city. I mean, isn't that better than your making beds or tending bar or waiting table? This is the Create Your Own Life show, where we interview people that are world-class performers, from Super Bowl champions to New York Times bestsellers to billionaires. We figure out what makes them tick and unpack it for you to do the same. I'm Jeremy Ryan Slate, and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we help you to create your own life. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here, and welcome to episode 715 of the Create Your Own Life show. It's a beautiful Monday morning, and I am stoked to be hanging out with all of you guys and humbled that you would just spend the time with us today to learn from our expert guest today that I'm just lucky enough to get to spend some time with and really learn from. Our guest today is Mitzi Perdue, and she is a very, very cool individual. She's a best-selling author. She is a speaker. She's done over 400 episodes of her own TV show, but she is also the widow of the late Frank Perdue of Perdue Chicken fame, and also her father was the co-founder of the Sheraton Hotel line, and she loves to tell an incredible story. So we're going to be taking a look at, in founding Sheraton, why people mattered so much, and then we're going to come back around the other side and take a look at why process mattered so much for Perdue. And bringing that back to even people again, so we're going to see the uniting characteristics here as well between growing two massive global brands and both that were started during times of, you know, really horrible issues as Sheraton actually came out of the depression and Purdue was originally an egg laying company, which due to a chicken disease actually moved over to the meat producing side. So I think it's really kind of cool and very pertinent for right now where there's a ton of opportunity out there in difficult times to figure out how to work through them and and maybe how to innovate just a bit. And I think today's episode is really going to help you with that because Mitzi really lays it out there in a really, really awesome way. But before we get into this interview, I want to quickly tell you about today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Audible. Audible is offering all Create Your Own Life listeners a free month of Audible and a free audiobook download. I actually just finished Drive Nine Lessons in Business and Life by previous Create Your Own Life guest Kelly Earnhardt Miller. If you want to get that book or any other book for free, courtesy of Audible, head over to jeremyryanslate.com slash book. That is jeremyryanslate.com slash book and get your free audiobook courtesy of Audible. Also, do not forget to subscribe for free in whatever platform that you listen to us to. It may be Apple Podcasts, it may be Spotify, maybe Stitcher, iHeartRadio, whatever it is, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss another new show. And while you're over there, leave us a review because that's what helps other people to decide that this is going to be the show for them to create a world-class life on their own terms. And I will read that review on the air. Today's review comes from... Nail Perkins. Nail says, listener for life, Jeremy genuinely cares about his guests and audience and is providing something amazing and thought-provoking with each episode. You've got me a listener for life. Thank you so much, Nail. Everyone, if you want to hear your review right on the air, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review or head over to ratethispodcast.com slash C-Y-O-L. All right, without further ado, let's get into this interview with Mitzi Perdue. Welcome to the Create Your Own Life show, Mitzi Perdue. What a pleasure to be with her with you. Absolutely. I'm so excited to have you on. I know you and I were talking a little bit before we chatted here that I listened to your interview with John Batchelor not that long ago about your book that you had written about Frank Perdue. And you're in a very 
interesting position, Mitzi, because your father was one of the co-founders of Sheraton, and you were also married into the Purdue family. And I'm, I guess I'm just kind of interested, starting with you know the background of your father. I heard you mention that he rushed into hotels when the world was running away from them. And I, I guess I want to kind of start there. What was it like growing up in a hotelier family and kind of you know seeing your father run for that opportunity? Well, first of all, it was fabulous, but I don't think he was a typical, typical businessman because he put a huge amount of effort on his family Mm -hmm. uh, and being part of his community. So he was more than just a businessman, but he had an interesting story, which maybe our listeners, I hope might enjoy hearing. Absolutely. And the reason I'm hoping that they might enjoy hearing it now is because he got his start during the great depression at its worst. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel that we're going through a rough time right now And maybe a story can just offer a little bit of help. Yeah. My grandfather, his father was a builder. And during the Great Depression, he was actually building homes. So I do think there are a lot of opportunities that come out of, you know, these downtimes. Well, my father was certainly an example. But I want to go back even a little farther in my father's story. Sure. Because about 10 years before he got into the hotel business, he got engaged to my mother. My mother was from a pretty successful grain distributor family in West Virginia. Here she had fallen in love with a Yankee. (laughs) She's coming to meet her future mother-in-law for the first time. And her mother-in-law tells her, Molly, don't marry Ernest, my son. He can never stick to anything and you're going to end up poor. Wow. And mother said, I don't care. I love him. (laughs) So they got married. But it was true that he never stuck to anything. And at age 26, he was just completely at loose ends. Wow. So he went to a career guidance counselor. And I'm, I think we're talking like maybe 1924 or so. Mm-hmm. He took a, you know batteries of tests. And at the end of it, the head of the Johnson O'Connor uh, guidance counselor service told him, Mr. Anderson, you're clearly a very bright man, but your social skills and your ability to relate to people are so terrible <laughs> that... I advise you, your your highest and best calling is to be a bench scientist who doesn't have to interact with anybody at all. Oh my gosh, that's rough. <laughs> well, but it happened to be the best possible advice that father could get because he decided as a good contrarian to prove Johnson O'Connor wrong. And he made it almost a 10-year quest to overcome his deficit because he reasoned in something that I endorse and recommend to everybody else that success in life depends largely on your ability to get along with other people. And he thought, hundred percent. Well, he thought if John Snow Connor says this is such a you know a career ending deficit for me, what can I do about it? And my dear father began taking psychology courses, trying to figure out what makes people tick. I know that he several times took Dale Carnegie courses. He read the Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I know that he read that. He recommended to us that we read it every 10 years because you'll get more out of it each 10 years. Mm. And I don't know if he took Dale Carnegie back then, but it was a lifelong quest to learn uh, what makes people tick, what is persuasive, what works. And this man who was supposed to end his life as scientist, not interacting with anybody ever, he became somebody who was so skilled at human relations that, good Lord, I think there are probably few people in America who interacted with more people more successfully. I mean, with the possible exception of national politicians, my father got into the hospitality industry and had to interact with tens of thousands of people each year and do it well, or he would have gone bankrupt. So I love the fact that he started out with a deficit and was able to overcome it and Mm -hmm. and do exactly what Johnson O'Connor said he'd be terrible at. But that's not quite the end of the story. He used the knowledge that he had so worked so hard to get. He told me, you know, as a young girl, I was forever asking him, Daddy, how did you do it? And, you know, he had a dozen different answers, but one that possibly that our listeners might most enjoy. He used to say that his success and the success of any hotel depends on the employees. Mm. And so here's an example of how he treated employees told me that for every hotel he ever bought, and there were 400 at the time of his death, he told me that the first thing that he would do on the day that he had taken ownership of the hotel, the first thing that he would do 
would be he'd invite all the employees to come into the ballroom. And the era that we're talking about, or the story that I'm about to tell, was probably 1933. Mm. This is a period when unemployment in the United States was 25%. So this is really in the, in the heart of the Depression. Heart of the Depression. And hotels were going bankrupt like right and left. And he knew that the employees that he was facing, you know, he's on the stage looking out at a sea of employees. It could be 400. And he knows as he looks at them that every one of them is demoralized. Everyone is thinking, I'm probably going to lose my job. You know, the new owner probably has his friends and relatives he needs to take care of and he wants to clean house. Now, I'm probably out on the bread line. Father knew that. And so the first words out of his mouth were, every one of you keeps your job. Now, imagine how good that felt. But that's got to create an incredible amount of, of loyalty to these people that till, I guess, before that time, you know, you were nobody. And now you're, you're somebody that they're very grateful to. That's the beginning. But the story goes on because he explained to them, I know that you know your job better than anybody else in the world. And, you know, I don't want to lose all that experience. Of course, I want you. And my job is to give you the resources and the encouragement to show the world just how good you are. Because you're going to see in just a few months, this is going to be the most popular hotel in the city. Wow. It's going to be the best served. It's going to be the most financially stable. And we're going to be a shining light to everybody else in the city that things can turn around. Now, would you imagine that the guys and women who had walked into that room came out feeling a little bit different? I would imagine they would carry themselves differently in everything they did then. You you know what I mean? Because that's going to show in every single aspect of their job then that this idea they're carrying with them now. But Father also felt that actions were more important than words. And so the next day, he made sure that the following would happen. The employees would see just a cavalcade of like decorators and repair people and carpet people and You have to spend a lot of money to refurbish a hotel that's gone to seed. I mean, stains in the carpets, frayed curtains, whatever. But the first money that Father ever spent in refurbishing a hotel was on areas that the public would never see. Instead, he would spend the money refurbishing the employee kitchens, the employee dining rooms, showers, lockers, the rickety old elevators. The first money that he ever spent was on areas that would communicate to the employees how important he felt they were. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome because it's like it really, to me, you're going to get the best performance out of somebody if they know what they do matters and they know that they matter, right? And the story goes a little bit farther. And that is, I asked him, I can see that you'd tell everybody that they keep their jobs, but why didn't you make them earn it a little bit? Why didn't you say, you know, you keep your job if you do a good job or something? And he said that persuasion comes in three flavors, and two of them are bad and one of them is wonderful. (laughs) The first one, not good, intimidation, that he could have stood up there in front of them and said, shape up or you're fired. He could get a lot of compliance, but it would be grudging. You know, people would do the minimum they could get by with because, you know, who, who likes to be intimidated? He said it's just not a persuasive way of getting what you want. He said, I could have stood up there in front of them and said, do a good job and there's a raise in it for you. Do a good job and there's going to be a bonus for you. He said, that's bribery. And there are a number of flaws with bribery. Among them, you have to keep upping the ante. You Mm -hmm. know, people don't stay bribed. But even worse, people work for the bribe rather than for something bigger. Because father's view was that a leader's job is to give people a better vision of themselves. And what he was doing was having them see themselves as part of a winning team that was going to transform the city. I mean, isn't that better than you're making beds or tending bar or waiting table? Well, it's it's a very tiny idea otherwise. And if you don't see the bigger picture, see like where this goes in and the, the revitalization of things. So the third flavor, I said it comes in three flavors. The third flavor is inspiration. He said, inspire, don't require. Have the person think, you know, I'm not just waiting table or whatever else. No, I'm part of something bigger and better and we are a winning team. Cool? No, absolutely. I I love that. Oh, and I love it particularly because, you know, he did make a success of at a time when people were 
afraid even to get into it. I like that because it builds kind of, let me know if you, if you think I'm right about this, but it, it builds a resilience of character, right? Like we're in a difficult time. You're helping people to, you know, become stronger, become bigger, become better and see the bigger vision. And that's, that's the type of leadership that guides us through, correct? Correct. And you know, one other thing that I don't know how many people this will be helpful to or not, but he never made any sort of success of his life until he was around 33. Grandmother was right. He did go from thing to thing to thing. I mean, he, he tried importing dogs and binoculars and paper suits. And just, <laughs> he really did go from one thing to another. And I, I think grandmother was probably thinking, yep, I'm, I was right. And I know that mother, who later became a society queen bee, uh, at that point, she told me that to feed her family, you could get, if you bought cracked eggs from the grocery store, a whole egg with no cracks was five cents. One with a crack in it was one cent. And, you know, there's a good reason they're so much cheaper because, you know, bacteria could come in. Mm -hmm. If you heated the eggs enough, you'd be safe. So mother, who at the end, uh, yeah, was kind of the, I don't know, well, the wife of somebody who owned 400 hotels. But there was a time in her life where not only was eating cracked eggs, she discovered that the boxes back then, say if they were a crate of oranges, it was wood back, wooden crates back then. I mean, I think now they're all cardboard. But back then it was wood. And she could persuade the, the grocery store person to give her the wood to warm the house. Wow. So, you know, initially, Ernest could never stick to anything. But then once he found what was right for him, oh my gosh, did it ever break loose. So I want to quickly tell you about today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Gusto, and this is actually the payroll management system that we use at my company, Command Your Brand, we've used them for years, absolutely love them, and they offer modern, easy payroll benefits and HR service to small business across the country. They were even named Best Online Payroll by PC Mag, and uh, as a listener, you'll actually get 100 bucks free just for trying the service via an Amazon gift card if you just head over to jeremyryanslate.com slash gusto and get your free trial. As I said, we have used Gusto at Command Your Brand to run all of our payroll, handle all of our taxes, all of that filing, and it makes it just a snap. We absolutely love them. So if you want to get started with Gusto and get a $100 Amazon gift card just for getting started, head over to jeremyryanslate.com slash Gusto and get started with Gusto today. Well, I guess speaking of eggs in this case, another story that I've heard you tell on, I guess, the, the Purdue side of your experience is, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I read that Frank Purdue and his father had started the business actually as an egg business. Exactly. And it was in a period of time when there was an issue with disease and things like that. And they found that there was a certain type of chicken that wasn't getting sick. And that's why they actually moved into the chicken business. And it's kind of, you know, looking at a, you know, just like with your father did, looking at a situation where things weren't going right and how you can see it through, you know, that's how the Purdue, you know, business kind of butted, if that's correct. Yes, that was another situation where teetering on the edge of catastrophe and you pull it out and it worked wonderfully. A, a few details of the story. There was a disease that attacked two major categories of chickens. They're the ones that absolutely do wonderfully producing what we call breakfast eggs. The mm -hmm. thing that you would crack into a frying pan and eat. And then there's the other major category of breeds, which are from meat. And they're not very good egg producers, but they've got great big Dolly Parton <laughs> chests. <laughs> That's a great way of explaining it. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I love to say that the egg producers remind you of, there was a famous, famous model, uh, probably in, I don't know, the 1960s or 70s or something, named Twiggy. And she was just skeletal. So there are the Twiggy breeds and the Dolly Parton breeds. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that the Dolly Parton breeds weren't subject to this particular kind of uh, it wasn't an avian flu, but it was a something that attacked birds. And lo and behold, there was this breed that didn't get sick from it. They had like three flocks that just absolutely failed. And at that point, they switched to the broad-breasted Dolly Parton kind. Uh, by the way, if there are any chicken farmers listening to me, forgive me because I'm not being very technical. 
It, it, it's funny. My family, actually, we raised a whole bunch of chickens. We have about 35 of them. And we have like Polish hens and we have all these different types of hens. But my family knows. I don't know the specifics. <laughs> <laughs> but to change from the egg business to the meat business is a huge change because the egg business, it's, well, it's a very different business. You just, you know, you collect the eggs and then you know where you're going to market them. In his case, it was a particular hospital in New York. You know, the supply chain was just understood. If you're changing to meat, it's a completely different story. And you have to learn a whole new set of supply chain and skills and, and processing them. It's just, you know, entirely different, but he did it. And I'm really glad he did because I don't know how big the egg business is, but chickens on a good year, we easily sell in 50 different countries. Mm -hmm. And then he also got into the grain business. And so about half of Purdue is grain and about half of Purdue is chickens. That's what I've read, which is very interesting about Purdue is, you know, like you had your own feed, you know, raised your own chickens. But then also the other part of it as well is one, you have one of the largest trucking companies, you know, in the country to handle a lot of this stuff. So I guess like, you know, looking at that, why was it so important to the Purdue family to make sure that like you controlled each part of the distribution network? I can answer that. Uh, in, in every case, the short answer is quality. <laughs> the longer answer is the reason that we got into grain is because Frank discovered if he was purchasing grain from the regular providers, he couldn't control the quality. Mm -hmm. And the quality of the grain has a huge impact on how well the chickens do. And if he couldn't be absolutely certain of the quality, he wasn't interested. <laughs> so, so he got into the grain business. And then as for trucking, I'm quite familiar with this story. I think I was going to try to guess how many truckers we have, but I'm, I'm going to be wrong, so I won't guess. I mean, I've heard <laughs> what I can't remember exactly. But what I do know is that if we were a private trucking firm, we would be the 50th largest. Wow. Because between grain and chickens, there's a lot of trucking and a lot of, for that matter, a lot of rail cars. But the reason that he got into trucking was that back when he was getting started, and we're talking, let's say, uh, 1968 or so, if you had to hire a trucker to take your, in this case, chicken meat to markets in New York, which is where he started, if you were going to take those, have those chickens meet the grocers in New York, you really wanted them to be on time. But here's what kept happening. You've hired a trucker and you know, you've promised him, I'm going to make up a figure because I have no idea what it would have been back then, but say it was $10 billion. <laughs> We're using a, a, an imaginary, has no relation to reality number. Okay, you've hired this trucker for $10 billion to take your chicken to the markets in New York. But supposing that all of a sudden, it's a nice spring day. There's a strawberry grower who needs his strawberries, which are highly perishable, and he's going to lose his, his year's income from strawberries if those don't get to market on time. And he comes up to the guy who has a contract with you and says, Frank Purdue is going to pay you $10 billion. I'll pay you $30 billion. Mm. And so the trucker's going to go with the strawberry grower. And what can Frank do about it? He can't fire the person because the person's not working. He doesn't you. work for you. Yeah. So in order to make sure, since Frank wanted to build his brand, at least in part on reliability, that if we say there's going to be a, a truck there in New York at the loading dock at such and such a time, that it will be there and that you can count on it. Mm -hmm. To get around the problem that I just described of unreliability. Then there were some other issues. I'm being hypothetical. I mean, I'm not saying this happened a lot, but I'm aware that in any industry, this happens. Supposing there's somebody with an alcohol problem or a drug problem. If they don't work for you, you might not know it. Mm -hmm. if, if your goal is reliability, you'd much rather that they be on the payroll and you can know ahead of time that they're going to be reliable. Well, it's, it's even something as simple as controlling you know, the schedule as well. Because I've, I've heard you talk about before that Frank would look at the situation and say, well, you know, Mr. Truck Driver, how long does it take to change a tire? And, you know, make sure you leave an hour early to make sure that, that if that tire happens to go flat, you're going to be on time. So you can actually take more responsibility for a lot of the things in your distribution channel. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And I think that Purdue was built in part out of employee engagement and employee loyalty. But I think it was also built, at least in part, Frank had a slogan, quality, service, reliability. 
And so he his efforts for his product were built around quality, service, and reliability. And if that meant that the trucker, I mean, we were paying him for it, but mm-hmm. if he had to leave an hour early in case there was a flat tire, we were willing to pay for that and he better do it. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, if, if you're not working for Frank, you know, you might think, what a stupid thing. Why would he do that? Mm-hmm. But well, I, I, because, you know, in each individual case, it, it doesn't make much sense. But if you look at for hundreds and hundreds and you want to be the person who's reliable and you can count on, it's worth it. Well, I guess like looking at, you know, a few of the stories you've told here, Mitzi, like I'm seeing a theme here and it's a theme to, you know, the Sheraton Empire and also the Purdue Empire is just how important people are. And, you know, how vital that is. And actually, one of the things that you frequently speak on is the idea of a family business and building a large, you know, family business. And and I guess, like, you know, looking at that with the businesses you've been a part of, how have, you know, you've really been able to build brands as big as you have while still, you know, making it a family business? I think it's a huge advantage to be a family business. And I'm going to tell a little tale out of school. <laughs> Did that get your attention? I laugh because I own a family business as well. My business partner is my wife and, you know, everybody in the family is involved. (laughs) Okay, here's the story. At this point in time, Purdue Farms is the largest producer of organic chicken in the world. And I'm incredibly proud of that. But if we were a publicly owned company, I don't think we could have done it. And here's why. Because... I'm a little bit losing track of time, but somewhere around 12, maybe 15 years ago, we decided we wanted to go organic. And a big push for that is Jim Perdue, who runs the company, or uh, who took over from Frank, his son, he has a doctorate in marine biology, and he had an acute scientist's awareness of the harm that antibiotics do to the environment. So however long ago it was, let's say it's 15 years ago, although don't hold me to it, but let's say it's 15 years ago. He decided with the management group and the family that organic was the way to go. Although this was not unanimous because there were some people who who worried that it was a fad. Mm -hmm. And Jim absolutely stuck to his guns. No, this is the, the direction we want to take. But it was a tremendously courageous thing to do because while you're switching over and you don't know how to do it because you're learning as you go, that means you're not competitive with your competitors. Your feed conversion is going to be worse. Your contracts are going to be more expensive. And we have a saying that anybody in the world can grow organic chickens. I mean, you can. The trouble is they die. Right. So you have to know what you're doing. Uh, If you're going to say no antibiotics ever, which we've done, I'm going to guess for a decade or so, (laughs) and that was a guess, but we've been no antibiotics ever for a very long time. But to be completely organic, that means the feed that the chickens have can't be grown on land that has, in the last three years, had genetically modified seed or artificial fertilizer or herbicides or pesticides. It's got to be truly organic. And switching over, guess what? It's horrendously expensive. And you can't just snap your fingers and say, oh, here we go. Because among other things, you have to persuade the farmers to do it. And that means they have to endure three years of lowered yield because if you're growing a crop without herbicides or pesticides or artificial fertilizers, that means you're not getting a big yield. Mm-hmm. So it's you know it's scary for the farmer. And then there's an a incredibly complex series of paperwork that you have to do for this. I've, I've been on farms and looked at pages and pages uh, that you document what you're doing. Well, it took us... I'm going to guess 10 to 12 years, really get it all figured out. And I talked with a veterinarian, or actually there are many veterinarians, but I talked with the chief veterinarian at Purdue Farms. And he said, you have to get 100 things right for it to work. Mm. One of those things wrong, the chickens die or they, they end up scrawny or one thing or another is wrong. You know, one of the things I just treasure, one of the magic keys, I mean, it's it's one of the 100, but I still love it. What happens if a bird gets sick and you can't treat it with antibiotics. Well, nature has some some very natural things that attack the pathogens that attack the chicken. And oregano is one. Oregano has... Really? Yeah, it has antibacterial and antiviral. I think I'm right in the antiviral, but I'm certain of the antibacterial properties. And I think I'm right in the viral, but 
let's stick with what I know, bacteria. If, if the chicken has a bacterial infection and you put extract of oregano in the water, you can cure the chicken as long as you get it early enough. Mm. Technically, it's a probiotic. And so we know an incredible amount about the probiotics to give the chickens if a chicken's going to be sick or if a chicken goes down with something. Wow. Well, we've told a lot of stories today, Mitzi. And I guess like looking at it, you can correct me on these numbers, but you know, you've written over 1800 articles, done 400 plus TV interviews, written several books. I guess like looking at it, like where do you get your love of, of telling a great story from? That's because of a, a deep philosophical belief that we are the stories we tell ourselves. And if I want to communicate things that will be helpful to people, I should do it in the form of a story. And since, well, you know, I'm going to answer that question on a deeper level. I have a purpose in life, and it's to increase happiness and decrease misery. <laughs> That's a great purpose. But how do you do it? I mean, with the tools that are open to me, the one that works best for me is stories. So, yeah, that's why I love stories. Oh, I've taken, I mean, I would embarrass my teachers saying this because maybe they're not doing a good enough job. But in my life, I had like a couple of years of coaching from Sally Strackbein, who teaches people about storytelling. And then I've taken courses and read books. Mm. Well, a history major in me absolutely loves that. I, I was I had my master's in history. So when I taught school, when I first got out of college, I didn't really stress to the kids that like the dates don't matter as much. But if you understand the narratives, you really understand history. And I feel like that is really what can teach us the biggest lessons are, you know, knowing the narratives and the stories. Oh, I couldn't be with you. And I'm a little bit embarrassed because I'm probably not living up to the training I just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess then taking a look at it then, Mitzi, if we were to take a look at something you believed at 21 that you do not believe now, what would you say that is? Okay. At 21, I really wanted to stand on my own. I really wanted to do things that that would be mine rather than came my way because I had a famous father. If I had to do it over again, I'd say, Mitzi, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say play the hand you're dealt mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, assuming that you have the immodest goal of being useful in society, you can be more useful if you use all the aces that you have in your hand. And I felt I was throwing away two out of four aces. Well, if you we were far in the future and you could be the one to decide what the legacy you leave behind looks like, tell me what that legacy looks like. I would like to do everything that I can, that I'm capable of and that the good Lord <laughs> had come my way to make a world in which people can be all they can be. And that means education. That means peace. That means health. My goal of having people be all they can be encompasses all good things, I think. And, and I guess to that extent, I know we don't have a ton of time, but you've also done a lot to help people in the human trafficking world as well to really handle that with, I know, an auction that you've been doing coming up, I guess, in 2021. So you really are about helping people in so many different areas of their life. Yeah, I'm a little bit worried about the 2021 auction. It may be on a pause longer than that. It depends on how COVID-19 turns out. Right. But meanwhile, I've written a book with Mark Victor Hansen, The Chicken Soup for the Soul Hero, and his, I think it's son-in-law, maybe it's stepson, Preston Weeks. And I would love it if people who are looking for inspiration would go to Amazon and look under Mitzi Purdue, and Purdue is spelled P E R. Either look under Mitzi Purdue or Mark Victor Hansen, How to Be Up in Down Times. And it's of the three authors, two of them, I think, just shower you with, with really useful information for getting through tough times. And I'd love to think that it was three, but I know it's two. And that would be Mark and Preston. Very cool. Well, Mitzi, if you could give us the name of that book again, then also where we could find you. It's been a pleasure having you on today. Oh, thank you. Well, my website is MitziPurdue.com. And I'll spell Mitzi. It's M-I-T-Z-I, -I, sort of like Mitzi Gaynor. <laughs> and Purdue is like chicken, but it's not like the university. The university spelled differently. I'm P-E-R-D-U-E. -E, so MitziPurdue.com. And if anybody would like to contact me, I'll answer them. Uh, and there is a contact page. For the book, the title of it again is How to Be Up in Down Times. And it's on Amazon. Very cool. Mitzi Purdue, thank you so much for joining me today on the Create Your Own Life show. It's been pure joy. Thank you so much. Hey, 
Hey everyone, thanks for hanging out with me and Mitzi today. You can check her out over at MitziPurdue.com or you can get the book she mentioned as well by heading over to the show notes page over at JeremyRyanSlate.com slash 715. Also, do not forget to subscribe for free in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else fine podcasts are downloaded. And while you're over there, leave us a rating and review because that's what helps convince other people that this is going to be the show for them to help them create a world-class life on their own terms. And I'll read that review on the air. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for hanging out today. I appreciate each and every one of you giving me a few minutes of your time to learn from some of our amazing guests. And now go out there and go create your own life. <laughs>